Thanks a lot. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Margaret Wasserman, and this is going to be the working group leadership tutorial. Um, we may get a few more people, but I guess I'll start since we're already about five minutes past the hour. Um, the structure of this presentation is that we'll start with a brief introduction to the presentation itself, to the class. Uh, then we're going to talk about um, how you start a working group. Uh, how we make working groups work for everybody and be fair and open. Um, steps in the working group process, how the working group does its job. Complex situations that can come up when you're running a working group. And just a short conclusion. Um, the goals for this class are to learn to be a more effective working group chair, uh, to find out what working group members expect from you, um, to learn how the working group chair, editors, uh, a working group secretary, which it doesn't stay here, and the ISG um, can uh, work together to make the process go smoothly. In general, this class is for people who are either current working group chairs, working group secretaries, or document editors, or who aspire to do those things. Okay? So anybody, the class is open to everyone, but that's who the focus of the class is going to be, is um, you as in one of the working group leadership roles. Uh, and how to do that job better. A lot of times people say, well, what kind of qualification should you have to be a working group chair? Um, we don't require a specific background, degrees, whatever, professional affiliation. Uh, but there are some things you should uh, exemplify or have to be a good working group chair. Um, you should be focused on uh, progress of the working group, but you should also be focused on being fair and open. Sometimes those things can be at odds with one another. Um, when you've got people who are not understanding a proposal or new people who come into the group who are seeking uh, to have their views be represented or a certain group of people or even just one person who disagree with something that's going on in the working group, sometimes you have to slow down progress in order to be fair and inclusive. But obviously, um, being fair and inclusive at the cost of getting nothing done at all would not be desirable. So you need to be able to balance those things as a working group chair. You need to be good at working with people uh, and at balancing um, the different interests of different people and managing to get progress done. Um, effectively, the working group chair is the manager of the working group, uh, the person who manages not only the process, but also the people in the working group um, getting the work done. Um, one of the big things about being a working group chair is this isn't about getting your own work done. Uh, when you're a working group chair, your name typically does not end up at the top of your working group's documents. You know, I chaired um, IPv6 for years, uh, but I'm not an author on very many IPv6 documents because when you're in a working group chair role, it's not about moving your work forward. It's about helping other people uh, to get work done and helping move the working group's work forward. So the question is, how willing are you to do your work through others? Um, how good are you at working with volunteers? Uh, these are people you need to inspire to do their work, not order to do their work. So some people who are good managers in a corporate setting where they own 40 hours of their employees' time um, come in and they don't do as well in an IETF setting where the amount of time they're going to get from the people in their group is um, dependent on how much they can inspire them to work, not how much they can assign or order them to work. Um, we also have to deal with um, working with competitors of ours. If you work at a company that's all, you know, your competitors are represented here at the IETF, you may have to work with those people. Also at helping people work with their competitors. So we may have competing companies in a working group and we may have to deal with the conflicts that that can arise, that can arise from that. Um, it's important for a working group chair to have good conflict resolution skills. Good people skills, good conflict resolution skills, um, good communication skills. There's also a whole bunch of kind of basic management stuff that goes into running a working group. Planning and running meetings, uh, managing the technical work, handling the charters, deciding whether or not to have an interim, kind of um, sometimes almost administrative type um, organizational management. So those would be the types of things you want to be good at um, if you want to be a working group chair. Now. Let's contrast that with the things you'd like to be good at to be a document editor. And a lot of times we make good document editors into working group chairs. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. 
Um, but to be a document editor, it, you're more focusing on the written communication. Working group chairs, yes, you have the email written communication, but not so much the writing documents part. Um, document editors need to be able to write a document. And it's not just an issue of writing good prose. You need to be able to organize a document so it's clear and understandable to potential implementers. And one of the questions is, you know, can you organize a protocol as well as you organize your code? It's a similar type of um, skill, being able to understand how to modularize sort of the text in a document so that people can understand, uh, you know, what the algorithms are that they're going to have to implement, what the major data structures are that they're going to have to implement. We don't detail those data structures. We don't say you must write a C data structure that looks like this. But sometimes the way you write a document can make it easy to implement or hard to implement, okay? And so the question is, are you good at writing a document that's organized so that it will be easy to implement it? And most importantly, for multiple people to implement it in a way that will interoperate. Um, I think it's a little melodramatic. I didn't write this line. Protocols live and die on, <laughs> on uh, document clarity. Uh, but it's true. Um, if the document is not clear enough, you're going to get uh, in, uh, implementations that don't interoperate, and that can make a bad reputation for your technology in the rest of the world. So, you know, it's very important if you want your, your protocol to be successful that the document of your protocol be clearly written. Um, RFCs are written in English. Uh, that's just the language we write them in. Um, so it's important that uh, you have good enough English skills to write an understandable document in English, but it's also important that you understand that they're going to be read by people who did not speak English in their, as their first language or who speak English but did not grow up in the United States, and therefore that you try to write them in a way that is going to be clear, avoids colloquial language, and is, um, you know, that would make sense to somebody who doesn't speak English as a Native American English speaker. Um, one of the things that's really important to note is that document editors also have to be able to balance that fairness and openness uh, against making progress, much as working group chairs do. Uh, most of the time in the IETF, the way things work is the working group chairs run the working group, but the document editors get up at the meetings and work on the mailing list uh, to track the problems that are open against their document and how they're going to be resolved. Um, and it's important that those document editors run that process in a way that's fair and open, uh, that they actually listen to and keep track of all of the input they receive, whether they agree with it or not, and that they um, you know, present that stuff fairly to the working group so that the working group can make a decision. Um, okay, so, so those will give you an idea of the different qualifications for a working group chair um, versus a document editor. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is if you do form a working group with, um, if you do form a working group based on your own work, based on an idea that you and maybe a group of your peers have come up with, do you want to be the document editor for that work or the working group chair for that work? You don't always get the choice, but you can kind of you know, know which direction you're hoping to move in. And there are, um, often you will have to pick. Okay, it used to be that it was not uncommon for one of the working group chairs or both of the working group chairs in a working group to write a lot of the documents in the working group. But we've moved away from that in the last 15 years or so, and at this point, it's usually the case that ADs, the, the area directors who are in charge of the working group, will prefer that the chairs of the working group not to be the document authors, and sometimes they'll prefer that at least one of the chairs not be a major proponent of a particular um, solution in the group, okay? And that's to uh, put in sort of a check uh, for for that fairness and openness that we talked about. Um, so even if you, even if as a technology proponent, um, the AD would be okay with you being a chair, you may be in a position where you have to choose between being a document editor and, or author and being the chair. So as I said before, document editors and authors end up getting their name on the top of the document. Um, they get to control a lot of the technical details of the work, not, I mean, they still need to do it under working group consensus, but they get some control over exactly how it's written um, and what solutions are proposed to the working group. 
And a chair doesn't really get that kind of um, either credit or sort of control over the document. Uh, but the chair is going to be really instrumental in making sure that the document moves forward. So you may want to think about which one of those sort of directions you want to go in, particularly uh, for work that you have, um, that you're a proponent of or have brought into the IETF. Uh, as we said before, some of the skills and motivations overlap. Uh, in general, editing documents takes more work at peak times, like just before IETF meetings or when there are major discussions about your document on the list, but less work over a long period of time um, than being a working group chair especially if a working group has a lot of documents, right? Each editor would only be responsible for, uh, you know, one or a small number of documents. Uh, the working group chairs lead the effort and influence the overall direction, but as I said, the editors have more direct influence on the technical content of the specific documents. They also get listed as authors. There's also these, these funny things called working group secretaries, and it's been really cool to notice that some working groups are using them these days. Okay, this was in some of the original documents a long time ago, and then uh, fell out of use if it was ever used at all, uh, and only recently have we started um, having some of these people again. Uh, working group secretaries um, can be really good if groups have a lot of documents or a lot of open issues, um, the working group chairs can appoint a working group secretary. Um, typically, they take minutes, uh, track issues, um, and keep track of kind of a lot of the administrative details of running the group. And in the groups I've been in, and I've heard from other people in the groups they've been in, working group secretaries can be invaluable uh, in terms of um, having good minutes, which can be surprisingly important in, in a contentious working group, uh, and also um, at tracking issues in an issue tracker, which can be an extraordinarily good way to remove a lot of um, emotion and a lot of uncertainty from handling contentious issues within a working group. I'll talk about that uh, more later. So how do you become a leader, okay? Um, people who w wish they were a working group chair or would like to become a document editor, what do you do if you want to um, become one of those things in the IETF? Uh, well, the first thing is that you're more likely to be appointed to some one of those positions uh, if you've been participating in the IETF and you're well known in that particular area, uh, that particular technical area or the actual area within the IETF. Um, ways to get known, ways to make yourself um, visible uh, to upper level leadership and be considered for these positions would include reviewing documents. Um, you could try to join one of the document review teams or just review them on your own in the working groups you're interested in. Sending mail to mailing lists when you have ideas about uh, the protocols that are being discussed there. Um, speaking at the mic during meetings. Uh, and volunteering to take minutes for working groups. Those are all good ways to get um, known in the working groups that you're involved in uh, so that you might be considered for um, some of these other roles. Uh, another thing, especially if you want to become a document editor, is to write documents and, and submit them to the working group, contribute to other documents, volunteer if there's a document in the uh, charter of the working group that no one seems to have written or be working on volunteer to write it. Uh, and, you know, the best way probably to become a document editor is to do a good job of writing a document. Very often the person who wrote it originally becomes the editor for that document when it moves into the working group. Um, if you like more detail on this, you could read RFC 4144, which is about how to um, gain prominence uh, and influence in standard organizations um, with, you know, it's written generally, but it, it you know, it all applies within the IETF. <coughs> so, uh, there's, there are many responsibilities that a working group chair has for a working group, and they're not all delineated in any one place. Um, this is kind of brought together from a bunch of different RFCs and, and knowledge of, of how the process works, okay? The working group chair is going to determine consensus at many steps. This is probably the most important job of a working group chair, is determining consensus of the working group. Um, and 
consensus is determined when we determine, when we ask the working group if they want to take in a new work item. Um, whenever there's disagreements about what proposal to adopt or about a technical detail of a proposal, um, also determining when a document is done and ready to be sent to the ISG. The working group chair is expected to make a judgment call about whether or not the working group has consensus in all of those cases. And as I said, that's probably the most important job of the, of the working group chair, but there are several others. Um, Working group chairs negotiate the charter originally in many cases and then charter updates over time uh, with their ADs. They keep the milestones up to date, hopefully, and, and um, realistic. So you've got a list of milestones for every working group. It's the chair's job to make sure that they, they currently reflect the state of the work and that the future milestones are realistic about when that work might be done. Uh, they select and manage the document editors. Uh, and they manage the working group um, to produce high quality re relevant output. Uh, they schedule and run the meetings. They provide initial agendas. Uh, they make sure the minutes to the meetings are kept. Um, they shepherd working documents during the document approval process. You can see RFC 4858 for some details on that. And they keep the process open, fair, and moving forward. Here's a list of references for working group chairs um, and other working group leaders. Uh, I'm not going to read this list. It's just a list of RFCs, but it'll be in the slides if you want to find it later to see which, um, which RFCs you, you might want to read if you want to be in one of those roles or have recently assumed one of those roles. So that was the introduction. Um, the next little mini section here is going to be on how working groups get started. And it's going to be kind of on the typical way working groups get started. I'll try to point out when there are sometimes exceptions, but um, this is kind of the way most working groups get started. Um, before working groups get chartered, typically the ADs who um, are in the area and are responsible for um, submitting a charter for approval are going to look for the proposed working group to have several things. Uh, first off, a well understood problem well written down in the charter text, uh, clearly defined goals in the charter, community support. And that doesn't just mean a certain number of people. Um, I've been in very successful working groups that had less than 20 uh, real participants, but they were the right participants for that topic. I've been in working groups that had many hundreds of participants. Okay, and in, it's not necessarily the case that the larger working groups um, had better support, okay? Um, because the question is really, do you have the right support? Which means both people uh, who understand the technology and are, are going to produce the documents and people who understand the problem and think that this is a good solution and are going to implement it and use it, okay? And if you don't have both of those sides represented, in a working group, usually the, the work output doesn't end up um, being very successful. You also need involvement from experts from all the affected areas. So if you're going to write a document on um, using IPv6 over some new media type, okay, you're going to need experts on IPv6, people who've worked before on putting IPv6 on different types of media, and some people who had expertise in that media type, okay? If you're going to write a document that's going to have a significant security component to it, you need to make sure you have people in the room who know enough about security to do a good review of that document, um, that sort of thing. And you also need to have an active mailing list. Typically, if you don't have all of those things lined up, you won't get a working group. The, the ADs won't um, really be interested in, in uh, working with you to form a working group. Working groups may or may not start with a boss. All right, we've seen a few lately that have been formed uh, in the IETF without a boss at all. It used to be very rare for that to happen, but it's happened more recently lately. Uh, that's contentious, but true. Um, they're not required. On AD, the ISG can charter a working group that doesn't have a boss, but generally uh, they do happen, and those groups meet once or twice. And uh, nowadays, IETF will host boss mailing lists. You can ask 
um, the ADs for a mailing list for a group that you're considering um, forming. Uh, the BOF proposals have to be approved by an AD before a meeting slot is granted. And if you want more detail on that, you could see RFC 5434, how to run a successful BOF. Um, let's talk about what's in a working group charter. One of the things you need to have to form a working group is a proposed charter. And every working group has a charter. And it should be maintained on an ongoing basis to reflect what that working group is actually doing. A charter has in it a section of administrative information, which is the chair and AD email addresses, mailing list info, where you can find the archives, whether there's a, a wiki page for this working group, maybe some other you know, information along those lines. Then you've got a section on the working group purpose, direction, and objectives. Um, which is, you know, what does this working group do? Uh, typically, it's got a section describing the work items that are expected to be produced by this working group. And then a set of milestones, uh, which are specific, this work item will be um, sent to the ISG or whatever on the state, okay? So those milestones are like one, like a bulleted list of when those work items, how those work items will be reflected in in specific documents and when those documents will be uh, sent to the ISG or, or maybe there'll be other milestones in there like when they might go to working group last call. Um, working group charters are like a contract between the working group and the IETF. So you put together a charter and then it's negotiated with the ADs um, and then it goes through an IETF review period before it gets approved by the ISG. And the idea is that when a working group is chartered, um, we have consensus, or at least consent, from the IETF uh, to charter a working group to do that work. And the charter represents what kind of a contract about what that work consists of, OK? So it defines the scope of the working group. It um, identifies specific work to be delivered. Um, it's initially negotiated between the working group organizers and the ADs, but then it is sent to the IETF community and the IAD for comment. It's approved by the ISG. Uh, and you know, you'll find that in different areas, um, different ADs have different filters for uh, whether to form new working groups. Um, some areas form more new, smaller groups. Some areas have kind of uh, catch-all groups that they put small work items into um, so that they won't form as many groups. Um, you kind of have to know your area and know your AD to know whether the best way forward for a new work item is to take it to one of those catch-all groups like int area or ops area working groups or whether um, it's an area that's likely to form a working group for a fairly small chunk of work like, um, like the security area sometimes will or some of the other areas. Um, over time, working groups recharter as needed. Um, those recharters can come in two different forms. One is minor changes, like updates to the milestones, um, updates to uh, little nits in the charter, uh, detail, you know, detail level changes. Um, those changes can just be approved by the AD. And as I said, it's up to the working group chair to keep the milestones up to date and realistic. And typically, all you're doing is marking some things as done and changing the dates on some things that are slipping, um, your AD will almost just rubber stamp that change. Um, whereas if you want to make a more substantive change, uh, there needs to be discussion with the AD about whether it would fall into the substantive change category, uh, which requires full ISG approval and will be sent to the IETF for review and so forth. So if you want to add brand new work items to the charter or change the scope of the charter, you're typically going to go back through the approval process. Um, okay, so that was it about starting new working groups. Let's talk a little bit about how we try to make working groups work for everyone. Right? There's a lot that could be said on this topic, but we're only going to hit a few high points. Um, consensus. Uh, there's a saying in the IETF, uh, we reject King's presidents in voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. I've heard that attributed to Dave Clark, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, I hear some nodding from someone who was probably there when he said it. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I don't know why it's not attributed on this slide, but I'll try to fix that at some point. Um, the, uh, the point is to have open and accessible working groups. 
um, and get quality specifications published in a timely manner, okay? And as I said before, getting things published in a timely manner and being open and accessible can sometimes be at odds with each other, and it's the working group chair's job to balance those things. Um, consensus is clearly dominant agreement. It's not defined in the IETF as everyone agrees, okay? Uh, in some places, consensus is defined as there is no one who doesn't agree. In the IETF, we use what we call rough consensus, which is clearly dominant agreement. It does not have to be unanimous. Um, judging consensus can be hard without voting, okay? You know, it, it's a something working group chairs have to learn to do, okay? Um, you can do a show of hands. Some people feel that's too much like voting and they don't choose to do it, so they have people in the room hum. Um, I don't hear the same out of both ears. And so the humming thing heavily favors people who sit on one side of the room and people who know that can manipulate it. So it's not like a good idea for me to ask working groups to hum, so I ask people to raise hands. Okay? Your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, you could try both if you're a new working group chair and see which one feels more comfortable to you. Um, it's even harder to figure out how to do uh, consensus on a mailing list without something that feels an awful lot like voting, okay? Because you've got to say, well, who agrees with this and who doesn't, right? And people write in and, and I mean, you kind of then have to count and it's a lot like voting. Um, the, the issue is that we're not looking for 51%, okay? We're not even looking for 66% or 72% or some exact number that's going to be um, the percentage of people who agree and therefore it's good, okay? What we're looking for is clearly dominant consensus. A lot of people agree. There are a few people who don't agree, and you know why, okay? And they're just, they're not ever going to agree, but they're not enough people and they don't have a strong enough objection to hold up the work. Okay, and that's something, that's a judgment call on the part of the working group chair, and it can be tricky to do, especially on consent, contentious issues, all right? Um, sometimes you call consensus, and it, the ensuing discussion proves that you got it wrong, and that's okay, all right? Then you say, okay, clearly there were some objections that I wasn't aware of, let's take a step back, let's talk about this, okay? Um, but you do have to call consensus in order for things to move forward. So, you know, as a working group chair, it's your job to figure out when there's clearly dominant agreement. And some people can be in the rough, they can disagree, but it shouldn't be, a, you know, a giant chunk of disagreement on where those people agree, disagree for the same reasons that are really still unresolved issues in the working group, right? Can, rough consensus shouldn't be a way to railroad something through the process. Um, at times, you have to discard parts of something to get consensus on the rest, okay? At times, there can be cases where you have a document, and it's important that it be published in order for your protocol to go forward, and you have consensus on 80% of what's in that document. But there's a lot of dissent about something else. And sometimes you need to get rid of the something else in order to move the part forward that the working group has consensus on, okay? So in IPv6 years ago, we had an addressing architecture document. There was dissent on the site local addressing type. Um, and we eventually reached consensus in the working group, rough but there, um, to move that stuff out of that document so that we could move the stuff forward that all of our work was blocking on. Okay? And that was a very tricky thing to do, but it's something that, as a working group chair, you can provide guidance to the process to say, well, what about if we move this out of here and we focus on the parts that um, we all agree on? Okay? It's one of the techniques you can use to try to reach consensus. Other processes have been defined in the IETF for reaching consensus, but they're not widely used. Um, so there's this RFC, if your group is blocked, try reading it, see if anything in there helps, right? They clue, flip a coin, um, <laughs> and so, but you need to get consensus of the working group to use an alternate process before you use it. I've never heard a working group agree to flip a coin on a, on a technical issue, but there's some other ones in there that are more likely to work. The point of all of them is to get the working group to agree that it is more important to move forward with either of these proposals or either of these choices than it is to block on these choices. 
And you can often get that consensus among a wider group in the working group than the people who really care about that one issue. All right? And then being able to move forward from there. Um, if you make the wrong call on consensus, your consensus ruling can be appealed. Okay? Uh, I personally have had several appeals um, lodged against my working group chair judgment calls. Uh, you know, they still let you be a working group chair. Nobody fires you. Uh, you just follow the appeal process at that point, right? You listen to what they have to say. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's well documented, okay? Um, and it's not even the end of the world if you get something you, you call turned over on an appeal. Um, you know, you just go forward from there, okay? But it's like anything we do, any decision we make in the IETF can be appealed by people in the IETF. Sometimes it's better to make an edgy call on consensus and, you know, see what happens. Because sometimes people who are still saying they don't want something are not that strong about it that in the obvious, you know, it's obvious that 70, 80 percent of the people in the room want X. And they still want Y, okay? A lot of times they'll be willing to agree that they're part of the rough. You know, you don't get an appeal every time someone disagrees with what you called because people know that the appeal process is pretty heavy-handed, only when they feel the, the decision was really wrong. Um, the appeal process starts with, well, uh, the appeal process for a working group chair decision starts with an appeal to the working group chair himself or herself to determine if uh, that working group chair um, agrees, given the argument of the appealing person, then a mistake was made. Uh, then it goes up to the AD, the ISG, um, the IAB, the IFAC Board of Trustees, if it's a technical, uh, if it's an issue about the process itself as opposed to um, an issue about a technical decision. When someone does want to appeal a decision, they need to do it in writing. They need to explicitly say that it is a pe an appeal. They need to make a clear, concise statement of the problem. They need to provide documentation. They need to make suggestions for a remedy. And they should not try to jump steps in the process because they'll just be sent back to, to those steps I just listed. Um, you need to wait if you're appealing something for a specific response to each step. And it's really important to avoid personal attacks in both directions. If you're a working group chair and someone's appealing a decision you made, whether or not they are a nice person, have a personal agenda, smell bad, okay, is not pertinent, and you should leave it out of your response, <laughs> okay? Um, ADs and working group chairs have different levels of authority in the IETF. Uh, a working group chair can replace a document editor. Document editors kind of work for working group chairs. Uh, editor replacement is usually painful. You're usually removing someone who wrote this document and has shepherded it for some time as a document editor, and it can be painful, but sometimes it's necessary. Uh, and it should have the backing of the AD. You generally shouldn't do that until you've talked to your AD about it. ADs can recommend document editor replacement. Um, they can even strongly rec recommend document editor replacement because ultimately the AD can replace the working group chair, okay? Uh, it happens rarely, but it has been used usually in a case where working group chairs have disappeared more than acted badly. I mean, we don't get a lot of people who act badly in the IETF. Uh, the AD can also close a working group if it feels that a working group is not making progress, and this has happened uh, rarely in the IETF. A really important part of what we do here is about openness, accessibility, fairness. Um, the working group should be open to any participants in person or via the mailing list. This includes people who have never been to an IETF meeting. Um, you can give preference to the opinions of people who've read the drafts or people who have expertise in a particular area or whatever, right? But you can't give preference based on whether or not the person attends meetings, um, whether or not you happen to know the person or whether or not, specifically, whether or not you happen to agree with them, okay? If someone raises an issue, it needs to be considered um, carefully, uh, regardless of where it comes in from. Um, we don't make final decisions in face-to-face -face meetings at the IETF. It might seem like we do sometimes, but we don't. Uh, all face-to-face -face decisions 
are confirmed on the mailing list because there are people who only participate that way. Um, meetings can be a good way for reaching and judging consensus on a complex issue, especially if it's something where we can get together and talk about it and work out a solution. But then once we've worked out that solution, we need to make sure there's consensus on the mailing list to implement that solution. Um, so, you know, that's different than a lot of other standards bodies where decisions are made in the meetings. And so it can be an adjustment for people who come from other standards bodies to, to learn to do it that way. Um, not everyone participates in the same way. This is a really, this is like the third bullet down on this slide or something, but it, it ought to almost have its own slide, okay? Um, there's cultural differences. There's language issues. There are gender differences. There are a lot of differences between people, okay? And as soon as you say there's this kind of differences, you're stereotyping on some level, right? Each individual is unique. Um, and quiet doesn't always mean I don't have an opinion. Loud doesn't always mean I care about this a lot. Some people are just loud. Some people talk more than others, okay? You need, as a working group chair, to try to understand what the real issues are, okay? You can see a typical scenario in the IETF, okay? I'll give a typical scenario. A big burly guy, big burly guy, gets up at the front, but he's naturally shy, okay? And he gives a talk, somebody gets up to the mic, they tell him something on his slide won't work, he says, okay, he doesn't really discuss anything with them, and he kind of goes away without asking whether the working group should adopt his document, okay? Big Burly Guy might have been intimidated by the little woman at the mic, okay? You don't know anything about these people just because of what they look like, just because of how they present themselves. You know, you need to then go try to figure out, was the issue that was raised a real issue? Is the person who isn't willing to push forward not pushing forward because um, they agree it's a real issue and that their document shouldn't go forward? Or are they not pushing forward because um, they were intimidated by somebody at the mic, okay? You know, you, you as a working group chair need to sort that sort of thing out. Um, another case that comes up is that someone who doesn't speak English very well will get up to the mic. They'll express something about the document. Everybody in the room looks like they're a deer in the headlights. The person at the front says thank you, and they move on to the next person to the mic, okay? You're the working group chair. If you can't summarize what that person just said, the person who's writing the minutes can't, and the person who just presented can't either, right? So you say to the person, okay, just before you leave, um, let me make sure I understand what it is you said. And you try to summarize it back to them, okay? If you get it wrong, hopefully they'll tell you you got it wrong. And at the point where you believe everybody in the room knows what that person just said, all right, at that point, if the person at the front is like, okay, I'll take that into consideration, next, next question, that's okay. But don't let people just their contributions be lost because the person at the front of the room doing the presentation didn't understand what they said, okay? And that's one of the things you as a working group chair should be responsible for in a meeting, making sure everybody's contributions are heard. Um, you're responsible for the openness and fairness, right? And sometimes that means interrupting and taking over some of that. I was at a meeting, Mike O'Dell, seeing him big burly guys, he's presenting at the front, and I disagree with something that he says, right? And he walks over to me, and he looks down at me, he's giant, he looks down at me, and he says, you know, something like, you're just wrong. And, and I look up at him, and I say, Mike, if you're going to punch me, come on, do it right now. If not, could you sit down, and we can talk about it? this? Like, because I feel hugely intimidated when a six-foot-two guy leans over me and bellows at me that I'm wrong. Right? But I am a very assertive human, all right? When you see someone else get bellowed at at a meeting, all right, and you're the working group chair, if they're not an assertive person, they may not say, wait a sec, I don't accept that I'm wrong. So, you know, it's your job to get in there and say, wait a sec, have you actually considered this objection? Let's make sure we open an issue on this. Let's make sure it gets in the minutes so that people get hurt. One of the things that's really good to do in, a, in an IETF meeting if you're dealing with contentious issues, say out of the issue tracker or something, is have some sort of structured discussion slides. I know people hate slides. I, I kind of hate slides too. But they're very helpful to people who don't hear well or who don't speak English as their first language, to know what issue we're on at any given time and to help them be able to more um, 
fully participate in the discussion. So when you're going to have more of an open ranging discussion of a set of issues, say from an issue tracker, it can help to have slides just summarizing each issue just to make sure that the working group stays on a particular issue and that everyone knows what issue is being discussed. Um, try to remember that openness does not um, mean uh, you know, we, we open the doors to the room and we let everybody in, okay? It means that we actually try to let everyone participate, right? Which takes a little more than opening the doors and letting everyone in. Written questions, consensus questions on a slide result in higher quality and more credible responses, okay? You know, if you're going to say, okay, so we have a proposal now to do this and we're going to add the thing to the other, we have the paragraph that John wrote, and we're going to put it at the end of the document, and then we're going to, so, so how many people say yes? Some people don't have any idea what you just said, all right? But if you actually put the question up on a slide, they can look at the question, they can understand what yes means, they can understand what no means, and they can give you a better response, okay? Um, sometimes you want to make sure you get all the alternatives out on the table before you try to judge consensus between them. Um, remember that openness includes accessibility to non-English, native English speakers. Hearing impaired people, people who don't talk as fast as people from New England, and others. Um, and if your minute taker isn't sure what the question was, consensus is going to be really problematic. You're going to think you've got consensus, and then you're going to look in the minutes, and you don't have consensus on what you think you had consensus on in the minutes. So make sure, if you have to, that you pause to make sure the minute taker has the question down um, before you, you make a consensus call. So now we're going to go through, kind of quickly, the steps in the working group process uh, from, are we going to get a question, a comment? Yeah, you may be covering this under complex situations, but I don't think it is. Uh, would you comment on the degree to which we are required to be open to crazies, loons, people who haven't read the specifications but have strong opinions anyway, and a whole series of other activities in that general category? Okay, I did actually say something about this a little bit earlier, and I maybe didn't emphasize it enough. I said you can give preference to people who have read the document. You can give preference to people who have credible technical expertise. Um, so, so you can, in, for instance, in a consensus call, say who here has read the document? Among those people, who thinks we should do X, who thinks we should do Y? That can be very useful, especially in a big room full of people where few people have read the document and the person who's the proponent on one side is very charismatic and the other person is not. We don't want this to be a beauty contest. We want this to be a sound technical decision. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about the people who believe that they have sound technical positions and have read the document and are off the wall. Yeah, I mean, the working group chair also has to use some judgment. I talked about that in the consensus section, that you're sometimes going to get the rough. And the rough can be people who have a, a good, a reasonable technical opinion, but it's the vast majority prefer something else. The rough can also be way out there sometimes. And there are people you just kind of have to accept that they're going to be in the rough kind of all the time. Um, crazy, crazy people, okay, who post bizarre stuff to your mailing list. We have a whole process for that, for getting them off of the mailing list so they will stop disrupting our work. Uh, Joel Yegley. Yeah, I mean, just quick observation is you will have to manage people who are inadvertently disruptive because of the way that they um, interact with the other people on the working group mailing list. Volume is not, uh, of messages, for example, is not, does not mean someone has more, more to say as a result of the fact that they are producing more output. Yeah, if you just say the same thing over and over again, it's the equivalent of yelling really loud. Okay, it's not, it doesn't make your point any stronger, technically. Um, so there's actually a little tool you can get. Uh, I, I don't know, talk to Thomas Narton or somebody. That, it's run on the IETF list um, for vo posting volume. And if you have someone who's posting way more than other people, sometimes just putting that tool up on your mailing list will make them realize the situation and self-manage if they otherwise seem like a reasonable human being. Crazy people don't self-manage. It's sort of part of their, their crazy. I have seen the use of that tool on working group mailing lists 
suppress perfectly good discussions because somebody decides that you're telling them that despite the fact that they are trying to carefully explain a position to somebody who doesn't understand it, that they're posting too much. The, the, the message here, I think, in everything that Margaret's saying, everything I'm saying, everything Joel was saying a few minutes ago, uh, is that this is a situation where a lot of judgment has to be used. As a working group chair or author, you've got the IETF's rules give you tremendous discretion as long as you don't get abusive and keep things open, but you actually have to do it. And yeah, and I mean, I there is no magic. There was a lot of stuff on the beginning slides about how this is a judgment position. You are expected to use your judgment. You are appointed to use your judgment. And if you don't use your judgment, you're not doing your job, right? That's So um, let's go through the document life cycle. Um, Many of you have seen this slide if you've taken the uh, newbie class, um, the next slide, uh, because it shows the same document life cycle, not surprisingly, that we have in the newbie class. Uh, but I'm going to go through each of the steps in some detail regarding what the working group is doing and working group chairs and document editors at that point. So we start with we've got the document in the working group and we're working on it. There are a whole bunch of steps to that process. There's nothing formally defined, okay, for steps as well. Some of this ends up in the working group document tracker. But this is, in, in some essence, it was originally how I thought about the working group process, because I wrote these slides originally from the um, years ago. But it's been updated by a long list of people that I'll, I'll show you at the end of the slides. Uh, so at this point, it's some kind of view of a whole bunch of people about the working group process, but none of this is nailed down. You as a working group chair can decide how heavyweight, how, how unstructured you want your process to be. You can skip steps. You can create new steps. It's all good, okay? Um, but to give you an idea as a new working group chair, some of the stuff you're going to go through, there are some stages um, of a document before it's officially a working group document. Those are in the screen box up on top, and some stages of a document after it's adopted by the working group. So. Um, we'll go through each of these stages in some more detail. So the initial submission, somebody has an idea. They submit it to the IETF. Uh, this could happen um, as like a boss or something, but most often it happens as somebody writing an internet draft for a particular working group. Um, it also could happen via mailing list. Obviously, our submissions come in in a lot of different forms. But at some point, if it's going to ever turn into an RFC, it gets turned into an internet draft that is targeted typically at a particular working group. I mean, given that we're talking about working group leadership, those are the only ones we care about, OK? Uh, the chair, the working group chair needs to decide what to do with the submission, OK? There are a couple different cases. One is somebody wrote a draft you asked them to write in answer to a particular goal in your charter, OK? That makes the decision of whether or not it's in scope pretty easy. But sometimes people just kind of semi-randomly send stuff to your working group. And you, as a working group chair, need to decide if this piece of work fits in your working group charter, is it in scope for the working group? This is a judgment call on the working group chair's part. Um, you, if you don't think it fits in your working group, you can try to send them to the right working group, or you can uh, send them to another area if you think it's in another area, uh, or you can talk to your AD about where your AD thinks this work might go. Um, it may be that you want to recharter the group to include this work, OK? But if it's not in the scope of your charter, you can't take it on until it is in the scope of your charter. Um, you should also reject submissions that aren't relevant or don't meet minimal quality requirements. You do not need to give every man, woman, and child on Earth five minutes of your working group's time before you reject their issue, OK? You don't have to. There's no rule, OK? If somebody brings you some work and it's weak, Somebody brings you some work, and it's not in scope for your working group. Somebody brings you some work, and you just don't think it's relevant to what your working group is currently doing. Um, they don't have to be given time at a working group meeting. Uh, and that's one of the mistakes I think a lot of new working group chairs make, is they don't want to say no to anybody. Uh, but it's your job to say no, because if you waste five minutes of working group's time, and there are 200 people in the room, you know, you've just wasted uh, many, many hours of good engineering time, and you've probably lost a little bit of focus in your group. You know, some of those people who would have liked to be there working on the real issues on your real documents feel that their time was wasted, and you made less progress on the documents you're really working on. Okay, so you as a chair need to decide what submissions should get presented and what submissions uh, should be brought into the group at all. 
okay? Uh, it's best, I think, to make people submit something and actually have it discussed on the mailing list before it's presented, um, typically. Um, there's no admission control on internet drafts. So you can't stop somebody from writing an internet draft that's IETF, I mean, that's a draft, their name, your working group name, blah, 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 blah. But you can stop it from automatically being uh, presented, or you can even stop lengthy working group mailing list discussion of it if you feel it's not pertinent to your particular working group. John, did you have another comment? And if you reject stuff and people think you are wrong, they can, of course, appeal your decision just according to the appeal process we talked about in the earlier section. Uh, okay, ob ob observation with the qualification, I'm a known hard nose about this. If something is not called out in your charter as a topic, your default response to a proposed new work item should be no. Right. Your job is to start with the charter and get the work done. Second observation is that if you're going to reject one of these things, and if you're going to accept it in a situation where you're in doubt, consult your AD. Surprising AD is a bad idea in this environment. Third observation is do not be afraid of appeals. The pain is felt somewhere else. Yeah, I've already gone through the don't be afraid of appeals Good. and what happens to you when your stuff is appealed and which is nothing, <laughs> nothing bad anyway. <laughs> yeah, we really don't have nearly enough appeals around. I, I think seven of my decisions were appealed. I, I used to hold a record. I haven't checked lately, um, but that's because I'm frisky and out on the edges and that sort of thing. You don't have to be quite quite as close to the edge as I am. But it doesn't hurt to get appealed occasionally. If you never, ever get an appeal, after years of running a working group, you've probably been weighing too much on the side of openness and fairness and too little on the side of getting things done. I talked to you about having to balance that sort of thing. So um, there's this stage. I made up this name, author refinement. OK, there's usually a period after submission during which the author is trying to make this submission uh, good enough, complete enough, full of consensus enough to um, become a working group work item. During that period, uh, change control lies with the authors, right? They're trying to make something that the working group will adopt. They can kind of do that however they want. They can decide to change the focus of their document. They can decide to merge it with some other group's document. All of that's kind of done outside the working group, OK? Um, it's most often done by the person who originally submitted the idea, but it can be done by others. Sometimes there's a design team, uh, either formal or informal, at that point that's working on the document. Okay? During this phase, the working group shouldn't be surprised if the document changes in a way that does not reflect any consensus call on the mailing list or any discussion in the room or anything. John? I don't think this phase should exist. And I don't think this phase should, should exist in an overwhelming number of cases. That if it exists, it's a problem with the charter and definition of the working group. That in their normal circumstances, the documents which the working group is going to process are defined at the time the charter is set up. And these things never happen in an author-controlled standpoint. Because by the time the first draft is written, it's already a working group document. And the author is responsible for the working group. You can't always arrange that, but in an ideal situation, these stray documents which show up written by somebody which were not explicitly part of the charter is, is already a, a, a failure in the process. Well, I mean, we're talking about a difference between, uh, typically, a solution scoped working group charter and a problem scope working group charter. John and I both favor solution scope working group charters, okay, but, but Thomas Norton, who used to be my co AD, for instance, prefers problem scoped working group charters, where you write a problem statement and then you decide what, you know, you're going to do for solutions, at which point you don't have any solutions at the point where you charter the document. So it, that tends to change this flow a, a little a little bit. Joel? Yeah, not to troll that too hard, but uh, the ops area certainly has abundant counterexamples of that. Whether it should or not is another question entirely. But um, there are certainly problems that arrive in working groups having not been defined as milestones previously. Um, clearly, they need to be within the charter, otherwise they don't belong there. Right. That's, I mean, that's the most important thing is, you know, go by your charter. And maybe we need to make some pushback on charters that don't, 
list the, the documents to be produced or whatever clearly enough, but you know, if the charter says you can also consider further proposals related to blah, blah, well, further proposals related to blah, blah might come in. Yes? Yeah. So, I mean, when, I, mean I, as a working group chair, use this, let the authors develop it a bit before you actually take the call. Quite frequently, you want two solutions on the table and the ability to choose between them, for example. You're still trying to solve the problem of the charter. They both try and meet it, but let them develop on the, as author drafts before you actually make the call as to which one's the better solution. Um, additionally, you may not actually got the document in the form or the scope of what you actually want, and you certainly should try and let the authors try and harden that up before you make the call as to whether you adopt the document or not. Yeah, I mean, that has a little bit to do with this next slide I put up here, which is working group acceptance, which has to do with when do you accept an item as a working group work item. Now, obviously, if you have a charter that lists a draft, this has already been done for you. Those, those drafts are going to start after this step. If you have a charter that lists a problem and you've accepted submissions and you've gotten to the point where you merge the two best proposals and now you have the document that you think the working group is ready to accept as a working group work item, um, what should you look for uh, before you accept it as a working group work item? Um, well, it has to fit within the working group charter. Otherwise, you shouldn't have been talking about it in the first place, okay? But it's not bad to do another little quick check at that point. Um, it has to have significant support from the working group. That doesn't mean 14 people or 24 people or 37% of the average number of people who attend a meeting. Uh, you know, it means people with expertise in all applicable areas who are willing to invest time and review the document, provide feedback, etc., and current or probable implementers. Okay, if you have a document that nobody is ever going to implement, you are writing an advice document for which there is no audience. You are writing an operational spec and no operators care, okay? You need to really question why are we doing this, all right? Um, it also has to be accepted as a work item by rough consensus of the working group. And when you're guiding the working group toward that consensus, you should make sure that they're not just going, yeah, we like John, we'll publish this document. Yep, John. Ah, no, we don't like Dave, we won't publish this document, okay? That's not how it works. Um, you want to actually make sure that the working group believes that the document is taking the right technical approach and it would be a good starting place for the working group's work, okay? Uh, and as I said, if it's already in the charter that you're going to use draft from t pump pump then that draft has already passed this step. That was done as part of the BOF process or the chartering process, okay? Um, you also want to make sure it has corresponding goals and milestones in the charter, uh, or you need to make sure that, that a milestone gets added for it. Sometimes you get things like um, you have a work item, and you think you know what it's going to be, but it turns out that it would be better if it was two separate documents, okay? That doesn't require a full recharter. That requires AD approval to add a milestone. Do you believe it is reasonable to have multiple competing drafts accepted as working group drafts? And if not, why not? I have a whole slide on competing drafts later, and, and, and I, I don't want to answer that question right now, because let's do it on that slide. Good, but I'm focusing particularly on the question about this issue of deciding on the solution before it's accepted as a working group draft, which gets back to my earlier comment. I, I actually have a working group draft right now that, that has, mul and I'm gonna, I'll talk about that on, on that slide. And, and, and it's not necessarily a question of a yes or no answer, which is why I don't want to try to answer it right right now. So, um, editor selection. Uh, what most often happens is the person who wrote the draft becomes the editor of the draft, okay? But you should at least, as a working group chair, understand that you're making that choice, okay? That, um, it, it's good to have a check-in with that person and make sure that they understand that the state of this document is changing that they're only going to change it from this period forward based on working group consensus. Check that they have the time to work on this document um, and that they're willing to work uh, in keeping with the working group milestones, et cetera, right? If not, consider somebody else who does have um, that time or who can uh, control the document in accordance with working group consensus and not their own opinion. Um, it's best to do this explicitly, not just by default. Um, some people are very good at concepts, at starting things, et cetera, but they aren't good at seeing them through to completion. Um, also, some people have changes in life circumstances, and you don't want to be in a situation where someone who originally wrote a draft that you're adopting 
becomes the editor, but they're not even working for the same company anymore. This isn't the focus of theirs. Uh, and that can, can really slow down work when you're not getting updates to working group work items um, in a timely manner. Then there's this whole period where the working group is working on a document, which I call working group refinement. Both of these refinement periods are sort of unspecified, that what happens in between the other steps that are more clearly specified in our, our processes and tools. Um, during this period, the document editors update the document based on working group consensus. All of the technical issues and proposed change must be openly discussed on the list, not if you fix a spelling error or the author's address or, you know, something like that. But when you're making a technical change to the document, it should have been discussed on the list. At least the editor should have said, I noticed that the bits were defined wrong in this section, so I fixed them like this. Any objection? Okay? But it should all go out on the list. People should be aware of what changes are being made to the document. The working group should not be surprised at this point by a major document overhaul that they have heard no discussion of. Um, the working group has change control in this phase. So Changes should only be made on working group consensus, but often in this stage, silence indicates consent. You write and you say, I put the flags in the wrong order in this part, I fixed it like this, any objection? And if nobody objects, that's, that's good enough for consensus at this stage about non-contentious issues. By the way, I added a security consideration section. Uh, you know, please read it, um, unless somebody comes back and objects to the security consideration section. Okay, you have consensus to have one. Um, at some point, there's going to be a working group last call, okay? The, the document editor thinks he's cleared all the issues that are open against the document. Uh, the fact is that two-thirds of the people in your working group have never read this document. One-third of them have never heard of this document, despite the fact you've presented it in front of them numerous times, okay? Working group last calls are sadly the time when a large people, number of people actually read a document. I don't know if there's a way we could be doing this better. It's something to think about. but. But this is how it, it works now, okay? And so it's supposed to be this final check that the working group has rough consensus, um, that the document is technically sound, that it's useful, that it's ready to go to the ISG. In reality, the first working group last call for a document is very often the point at which you find out that it has two or three significant flaws that have never been raised before. And so you go back into document refinement and, and try again. John? One observation, one question. The observation is that one of the ways of slightly getting around parts of this is to do mini working group last calls on specific clusters of issues, sections of documents, and various other things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it's just a waste of time, but it's an option that one has. Right, especially for a really complicated document that has a lot of contentious issues. If you can close them one by one, it can actually be a lot better than trying to yeah. discuss them all at once. We're talking about a lot of issues, period, and you're trying to make converge. But that raises the other question. Do you have comments on the situation in which it's discovered nearly at working group last call that you've got an editor who is never going to be able to write competent technical English? And that, that has been characterized as a not first language problem. It has nothing to do with that. No. No, I, I, I mean, you do it sometimes. For one thing, if, if you have a document that you just sent to working group last call and this is the first time you as a working group chair are reading it, you are not doing your job. Okay? <laughs> See, you should have read it before this and know if it's so badly written that you need to fire the editor or get an extra editor to help them or figure out a solution to that problem. Okay? You should not be shocked by the condition of a document that you have just sent the last call. Um, you know, it does happen, though. It happens even to people who are trying to do a good job, especially in working groups with a lot of documents. What, and one of the things you have to solve the problem when you find it. One of the things you need to look out for is that if a working group is functioning really well, there's a shared understanding in the working group of what's going on, and, and everybody's reading things. There's a shared understanding in the working group of what's going on, and that shared understanding may lead to non-detection of ambiguities which are really serious and show up only later. And again, you just have to be alert, try to watch for it, try to look at these documents as if you are somebody who doesn't know anything about the subject matter. Working group last call, the point at this point is to try to make sure that this document uh, has been reviewed and actively supported by a significant number of people, including the experts in all the applicable areas, and that it's, you know, good, that it's done, that it's baked, 
or it shouldn't be sent to the ISG, okay? At this point, silence really shouldn't indicate consent, right? You should make sure that people actually read the document. You should make sure you have read it yourself as a working group chair and that you think it's ready to go to the ISG. Um, why would we want to waste the ISG's time on a document that we can't be bothered to review ourselves? If you can't get, you know, a few people in your working group to review the document and say it's good, why should you send it to 15 very busy people to review it? Okay, clearly it's not important if nobody in your working group wants to review it, okay? So it's okay as a working group chair to say, I'm not going to send this document forward until three or five or whatever the right number is for your working group, people review it. Or I'm not going to send it forward until we get somebody who knows something about this underlying link there to review it or until we get somebody who knows something about security to review it. And if you need review from areas that you can't find, um, you can talk to your ADs, you can talk to other ADs, uh, there are directorates that you can write to and say, hey, you know, I really need somebody with a clue on TLS to read this document and make sure we aren't completely out in left field before I send it to the ISG. And you can usually get someone to do that. Uh, if it's a MIRB, you get ops people to review it early, ideally, uh, so that you don't spend a lot of time, you know, re rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic or, you know, otherwise crossing your T's and dotting your I's on a document that's so fundamentally flawed that parts of it have to be rewritten. Um, but if you do, if you find that out in working group last call, it's better to find that out there than in the ISG. Robert? So, do you think working group last call is used a bit sometimes, as, as you said earlier, some people haven't even read the document until it goes to last call. So is it being overused, overloaded a bit to kind of kick people into action to say, hey, you better read this or else you know, we're, we're going to forward it without any, you know. It is because it's effective yeah. that way. I, you know, I don't know of another tool that would be. No, because people... Some people don't want to read six versions of a document. And, but then they end up reading six versions of the document because there's six last calls. So I don't know. But it, uh, I don't know. Um, one of the things you should ask yourself as a working group chair before you submit a document to the IETF is, has anybody else read this document? Okay, especially if you're in a small or siloed working group of people who don't represent the diversity of the IETF. Um, Standard track documents are supposed to reflect IETF views. They run on the internet. Try to avoid the group think trap, okay? If you're in a group of people who work closely together, who are from the same types of companies, who all agree on this protocol, all right, maybe you need to get out of that group think trap at this point and say, who else should be reading it? And as I said, ADs can help you find people. If you've got some tricky security stuff in your draft, and to your knowledge, no one with security expertise has read it, there is no way your work is done. All right, so don't send it to the ISG to find that out. Get somebody in to help you out earlier and find that out then. You want to try to avoid last-minute surprises. Some examples of last-minute surprises are discovering that no one plans to implement your new spec at this point in the process. Okay, kind of sucks, but, you know, try to avoid that. Uh, discovering that the security mechanism does not meet the current requirements of the IETF. This happens a lot. Used to happen way more. Um, Learning that work overlaps or conflicts with work in other working groups. All right? You want to try to avoid these things by seeking review from pertinent other people and, and keeping other parts of the IETF aware of your work earlier in the process than, than when you send the document to the ISG. So you made it through work group last call. You have consensus to publish it. It's time to send your document to the ISG. And then we go into a state called document shepherding. Every draft needs to be assigned to document shepherd these days, All right? This was uh, instituted, I don't remember how long ago, 10 years ago, something like that. Uh, and every document has a document shepherd who fills out a proto write-up. Proto used to stand for process and tools. When Allison and I founded Proto, it was the process and tools team. Then there was the tools team. And so then the process and tools team didn't stand for the process and tools team anymore. We decided it stood for the process teamo. Okay, uh, <laughs> we, we don't know what that even means, but um, there's this thing called the proto write-up, the document shepherd write-up. You have to write one for every document you're sending to the ISG. The first question on it is, have you read this document and do you think it's ready for publication? You, personally, all right? Another time when you are expected to exercise judgment. If you do not believe that the document is ready for publication as an RFC, don't send it to the ISG, okay? 
fix it. <laughs> do you have a working group chair? Run the process, get the document to be ready, and then send it to the ISG. Um, when you're done with the proto write-up, you send it to your um, I don't know why what that sentence means because you don't that's not what you do anymore. But you submit the proto write up and the document to the IETF secretary uh, for publication. Um, you can read about proto shepherding in RFC forty eight fifty eight. Um, at that point, your AD, uh, your area director, the responsible area director for your group, is going to do something called AD evaluation. That's when they use their judgment, and they won't send the document to IETF last call or to the ISG unless they personally think the document is ready for publication as an RFC. John? Just a warning. This process is under active re review and renegotiation the ISG. There are differences in how things are handled in different areas and even between ADs in an area. And before you get very far into this process, you should coordinate with your AD and make certain that whatever you think is going on is the same as whatever he or she thinks is going on because ultimately their, their opinions count more than whatever's on the slide and, and more than 4858. Should it be that way? That's a separate discussion. Well, anyway, these are the steps that, that I understand you follow for document shepherding. Um, after the AD evaluation, well, during the AD evaluation, you're going to manage that discussion with working group chairs and uh, with, uh, with the working group, the editors, and the AD. The AD usually sends a big email with whatever their issues are, and then you work with the editor and the working group to resolve those issues. Remember, the AD does not just get to decide. Okay, even if they send you text, you don't change the document without discussing it with the working group. Okay, they can hold up the document, but they don't get to change the document without the working group agreeing to make that change. And very often, okay, ADs bring up issues, and the working group doesn't agree that the AD is right, and there can be discussion, and the AD can say, you know, actually, you're right. I, I, I withdraw my concern. John? And sometimes the AD doesn't. And one of the things that we have had a shortage of in the IETF is appeals against abusive AD behavior at this stage. Then the That's document. Right. Yeah. Or even uh, closing a working group. Pardon me? Or even closing a working group. We had a recent uh, exposure to this, how did you call it? Abuse? Well, I, yeah, I, I can't really comment on, on a specific instance because I don't even know what one you're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I don't either. <laughs> I'm talking about decade. Okay, so an AD closed decade and you didn't agree, did you appeal? Five days after I submitted a draft and while two drafts were in evaluation by the AD. You can appeal. Oh, I know, but I'm not the working group chair. You I'm can just, appeal anyway. You can appeal anyway. Anybody can appeal. It, it, it's not my business, really. It's just that for me it was a very, you, you called it a very rare occasion. It is my business. I, I started the avalanche of emails on this business. But, you know, it, it, it cannot be a single person. If <laughs> other people think that it's something that should be happening, it should be happening. We, we can have a discussion later about that. <laughs> but for me, it, it was just a really big surprise. Just, just like that. So, and you, you, can, you can go through the mailing list. All of this is documented now. Because I actually triggered this process of documenting what has happened. Well, the, 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 so I did the, my part of the idea, but I don't have to. The, 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 there are complicated judgment calls here, and ADs have a skinny hard job. And as and, 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 and somebody who is precipitously, more, more precipitously closed down working groups than anybody else in the IETF, uh, it's. No, it's, that's it's, not true. Randy topped you at least once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Randy did it on his last day on Wednesday of that IETF in the middle of their meeting. After I sent the precedent, thank you. Go ahead. Do you feel that you want to look at for her historical basis is, is, is the appeal over the closing of the GROW working group? Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, uh, there's sort of abundant historical documentation for uh, the precedent that you're discussing, either the basis for an appeal, uh, the appeals process on that, or who lodges one in the case of uh, that particular one. I, I, I don't really believe in appeals. Well, then, 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 then part, part of what I think I'm trying to say is get over it. 
I am completely over it. It's a really important check on the process. No, he means get over the part where you don't believe in appeal. That's right. Ah. <laughs> That's right. It's an important check on the process. The AD job is horribly difficult. They are juggling many balls. It's it's quite possible for them to make decisions without fully understanding whatever's going whatever should be going on. The community put them in those positions, and they're entitled to the assumption that they've got it right most of the time, and usually they do have it right most of the time. But if you feel like there's a, like there's a situation in which the AD made a decision without understanding all of the issues. The appeals are really important, and we don't do it enough. ADs make mistakes. No, no, okay. okay. I, I was an AD. I made mistakes. Okay, there are other ADs in this room. I would guess that none of them want to exempt themselves from the list of people who, in retrospect, made some mistakes. I mean, it, it happens. No, 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 no. I, I agree. The, 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 point, the point I'm trying to make here is that, to me, it, it, it looks like it's not rare because it happens very close to what I'm doing. One. The second thing is that obviously everybody makes mistakes, right? I think only the Pope doesn't. But the, what I'm trying to say is that, um, how can I say? Assuming that you have a very lazy working group, it's not going to meet any kind of milestones. It's not going to do anything, you know, I don't know what, which was not the case for decades, right? I think you should give, you know, a graceful death, right? You should assume, I don't know, maybe you sometimes, so, so, so the sudden I, death is what, again, you know. Have, I, I think that this decision. would be an awesome thing to discuss in the ISG plenary and, and not in the middle of the... I, I, I'm not going to bring it up again. I, I think, I, you know, people, no, people are familiar with it, and that's basically... But, but again... I mean, just, I'm trying to understand how this works, right? Yeah, like I, how, the, how fast can it... You know, sudden death of a working group can happen. Have, 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 have invested have, effort the the problem is that we're not even going to get to the stuff about IPR or how to deal with difficult issues in the working group or anything in this class if we, <laughs> if we keep segueing on this topic. Just one more thing about it. Um, I think appeals are important, but it's really hard for a working group chair to appeal his AD because they have to work together all the time. Sort of uh, sours the whole... Well, all... Um, appeals should start with just going to the person and talking to them and I certainly on many occasions as a working group chair have gone to my AD and told them that why why I think what they just did was wrong and sometimes it has changed what what happens the problem is what happens if it doesn't change if, 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 if your working relationship with your AD is so bad that you don't feel able to challenge what you think is a bad AD decision let me be blunt about this. You have no business being a working group chair in this community. No. Perhaps I'm not talking about challenging it to his face, which I would do at any time. It's challenging him to the ISG. Yes, I, so I don't see a problem with that. Why wouldn't you do that? Because until the whole thing is resolved, you still have to work with him not for a long time. Um, so These things take weeks, not months. So, so uh, I, I think the part that I would like to amplify to, to the point being made about document shepherding is um, if you are a document shepherd or you're the working group chair acting as a document shepherd, um, members of the IESG will have disagreements with your document authors about the contents of the document. Um, as the shepherd, it's not your responsibility to uh, resolve those to everyone's satisfaction, but it's to make sure that that process keeps working. And um, so, you know, if my document authors have an issue with Pete Resnick that results in a disgust, then, you know, that's an issue that we have to work out as um, as the shepherd uh, jointly with the authors and with our area directors because, you know, we need to advance our documents. And so, um, I think one of the things that is important to understand about this process is that it is not free of conflict. So if your culture says that we don't have conflicts in public, you're going to have a problem here because that is going to have to happen. Um, so the way that we resolve issues when we have disagreements about them is we work through them. Another comment on or are we moving on? Okay. Um, so. ISG review. Um, after your document uh, gets the proto write-up done for it, and, and you know I just talked about what the document shepherd role is, um, you're going to submit the document for publication. You're going to send in both that proto write-up and 
a publication request uh, to the ISG, you actually do that to um, ISG secretary at IETF.org, I think it is. You can find it on the ISG page. Um, after the publication request, the status of the document can be found in the draft tra tracker, and you as a document shepherd will have to check this often. Okay, it doesn't always seem to be the case that anybody tells you that there's something you need to do about your document. Um, you should be getting mail if you're listed as the document shepherd of the document, but you should make sure you're listed because somehow that doesn't always seem to happen. And I know it should all be happening, but that doesn't mean that it does. So check that you're listed so that you'll see the updates on the document. Uh, your document may move back into uh, revised ID needed. At any point where it goes into a state like revised ID needed, um, that means you're taking it over at that point and making sure that all the issues get brought before the working group, that the document gets updated accordingly, and that you know it gets moved on to whatever the next step is. Um, the first thing that happens is this AD evaluation. A document will not go to IETF last call or to the ISG until your AD approves of it. This is not in any process document, and yet it is universally how it is done, okay? And typically, almost every document will get some sort of issues back from the AD before it will go to IETF last call. Um, it, th a lot of times, uh, the AD may ask for specific directorate reviews at this point. Um, or other reviews from other experts. Sometimes the AD just reviews it themselves. Uh, and it's pretty typical for them to ask for a revision of the document before it moves forward uh, to IETF last call. Uh, at that point, it goes to IETF community review in the form of an IETF last call. And uh, the length of the last call depends on the status of the document. It'll be a two-week document for last call for a working group document, a four-week last call for an individual um, document. Uh, informational or experimental documents don't have to go to IETF last call. It's up to the judgment of the AD whether to make one or not for those documents. Yes? Well, just going back to the previous slide, you, you, those <laughs> checks there are things that you should have, sorry, the one before that. If you get asked by the AD for a review by area directorates, and you've missed it earlier, two steps on before that in the process. Um, no, the area directorates mostly do it during last call. You no, but I mean, you should have had those other reviews before or during the point when you use the proto shepherd write-up. You're asked at that point, have you had those reviews done? Right, for any specific experts that would be pertinent to this yes. document. Yes. So, so and if your AD demands another one, yeah, you've kind of messed up. But I mean, yes. live and learn, right? Next time you know. Yes. So, so remember, that a lot of these are checks on things you should have already done, not the right step in the process when they should occur. Yeah, it's true. So um, during IETF last call, individuals, cross-area review teams, and directorates will review the document. Um, all comments that you receive during the last call must be addressed before the document advances to the ISG for approval. Addressed does not mean you must be a slave to whatever anyone says at that point. Addressed can be we have considered your comment and you know these are the reasons that we don't believe any change is required to the document. Okay, but they all should be responded to and considered. Um, and then after all those issues are considered, uh, the document goes back to the ISG. And this is where the actual ISG last call, ISG process happens. Um, there may be some directorates that didn't review the document during the last call or other experts that the ISG chooses to call in. This would be other ADs other than your own uh, calling in people they want to have review the document. Um, like the mid doctor, security directorate, uh, general area review team, et cetera. Uh, but typically, they try to get those done during IETF last call. Okay. Um, the official IANA review, that also is supposed to happen during IETF last call, but if it hasn't completed yet, that may happen at this stage, and you may get back IANA questions um, on your document. And then there's the actual ISG cross-discipline review, okay, cross-area review. Um, they take the IETF last call comments into account, if there were any. Uh, they can decide to pass the document on for publication. 
Uh, they can at this point make a final decision about what the document track and status is going to be. So you can have submitted for standards track, but they can switch it to informational or vice versa. Um, they can send a document back to the working group with comments, which are non-blocking comments on the document, or discusses, which are blocking comments on the document. Uh, and discusses must be resolved before you can become an RFC. Uh, it used to be that you would get discusses back that consisted of someone had checked the box labeled discuss, but they did not put any text anywhere saying what problem they had with the document. It, I used to just like beat my head against the wall because of that. But because of the issue tracker and the way it's set up now, uh, it's very hard for them to do that. So you almost always have at least some text declaring why there's a discuss on your document. That that was a 50 years ago improvement. <laughs> Uh, maybe 10 years ago, I don't know. I keep getting older, so it's probably longer than that ago. Uh, we wrote the Discuss Criteria document, um, trying to explain why people should be able to hold a Discuss. Prior to that, you would get a Discuss that said, I am going to block your document potentially forever because you did not cite my academic paper. Uh, I'm going to block your document forever because I don't think it's a good idea with no further elaboration <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> and now, in theory, uh, the ISG has agreed to conduct themselves by the criteria and the discuss criteria document, which you can still find online. Uh, Allison Mankin and John Peterson and I wrote that in a, a, in a bar. Uh, and <laughs> it's a dark moment in our lives <laughs> over Drake's, um, which were much needed. Uh, and um, it still exists today as the criteria that the ISG uses. And it, it can be a way to challenge um, discusses that are unreasonable. Uh, and um, you have to deal with, you have to address the comments, or at least look at and process the comments. And you have to get the ADs to agree that you have resolved all of the discusses uh, before the document will be published. Uh, so if you're the shepherd, you're going to now get the working group engaged in that, go through a revision process to um, answer uh, all of these issues that were raised uh, in order to get the document published. John? I'd like to pose two scenarios with the understanding that these things have never, never happened or almost certainly never happened in the future. Right. Uh, scenario number one is you go into IATF last call and some reviewer from another area comes and, oh, you come into IATF last call with a document which says, if you're going to try to read and understand this document, you absolutely must understand these other things first. And a reviewer comes in from some other area who has clearly not, who writes a review, the review clearly does not reflect an understanding of those other specs, clearly does not reflect an understanding of the general technology being discussed in the spec on being last called. He writes an inflammatory review on that basis. You explain to him that he hasn't read the other specs and it's not particularly, and his review is not particularly relevant. He decides he wants to carry out a long debate on the IETF list, such as every response gets a longer and longer response from him on the basis of his non-understanding technology. But if he doesn't understand it, there must be something wrong with it, because he's a smart guy. Right. Uh, and, and the question in this purely hypothetical situation, which has never occurred, is how you suggest the document shepherd respond. I, it depends a, a lot on the specifics. I mean, sometimes you have to take those things offline. I find that trying to set up a conference call uh, with certain pertinent people can often quickly diffuse something yeah. that is happening that's ridiculous in, in, on email. In, in this entirely hypothetical situation, tried that. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a stage where documents do get stuck sometimes. And it's not always some kookazoid on the IETF list. Sometimes it's a kookazoid that the NOMCOM picked and put on the ISG. Uh, that, that, that may or may not relate to scenario number two. I had a document that was held for four months on a discuss that had no text. Well, let's try. And, and when I tried to understand what the text was, what I got back was I am not going to let the nose of that camel into this tent. Yeah, I can figure out who that is. <laughs> um, but, but, but the other one under current rules, at least as, as interpreted, is if something gets through an IETF last call, there are no negative comments of the IETF last call where they have all been disposed of. And some area director stands up and says, I do not like that design decision, and until you change it to this other way of doing things, this document is going nowhere. Uh, there's two things you can do at that point. One is that you can talk to the, let's say you've tried to have a phone call, you've tried to do everything, nothing, it's intractable. Okay? You can talk to the IETF chair. 
the IETF chair can do the ISG override procedure, which requires that two ADs hold the position in order to block a document. Okay, that's the lightweight choice. The second is you could try to appeal it. There are some people who argue you can't appeal at that point because it isn't a decision. I would argue that the choice to click the discuss box required a decision, and why can't you appeal it? And I would appeal it. But it would be two people's decision, but that's the reason I can't appeal. I mean, there's two chairs you can appeal, right? I could appeal the two people who are holding it um, because the ISG didn't succeed in doing an override. Once, what, once again, the message here, although, although it's coming out as a discussion between Margaret and myself, is that you are not powerless in these situations. And if you have to push back, push back. It's your responsibility is to the working group, not to placate, placate a reviewer or an AD who's being, in your judgment, unreasonable. It's very hard to appeal a couple of things. If your AD puts it in AD evaluation and never evaluates it, I think your only recourse then is the recall process. Which, which is kind of outside the, the focus of this class, because there's no decision there to appeal. Uh, uh, appeal on mechanisms insufficient to, to, to permit You could, possibly, right. Um, but getting back to this particular thing, we had just gone through the ISG review. We've resolved all the issues in this particular case. And we're ready to go to RSC publication. Um, that's when you get the RSC editor in the loop. And uh, we have some fine members of the RFC editor in the, in the back there. In fact, people don't know them. Uh, Alice and Sandy are here. <laughs> yeah, we often see their email. Um, so you go, first your document on ISG approval gets added to the RFC editor queue. Uh, if you have not submitted your source file, the .xml or NROF or whatever source you used um, previously, like when you submitted the internet draft, uh, it would be nice to send it in now. Um, you might get questions from the RFC editor. Uh, if you do, you should answer the questions. Uh, at some point, um, the document will be ready for publication. Uh, and you will get an OS 48 notification with a pointer to the edited version of the document. Um, it's always edited because RFCs aren't even formatted the same way as Internet Drafts. So you always get something that's different from your document. You should do the diffs. You should be aware of all the differences and make sure that they make sense. Okay. Uh, they may fall into various categories. Needed to be an RFC. Uh, happened because somebody's address changed or something and it made sense to do it. Um, or editorial changes like, um, you know, you use which when you should have used that or, you know, they always take out about a third of all the commas I have in the document and I thank them for that because I know I use too many commas. Um, and some people don't put in enough commas, they get them all added. Okay, that's, that's all good. Uh, sometimes you get something and you read it and you say, and it says, and this is an actual example prior to our current wonderful RFC editor staff. Uh, I had a document that talked about well-known addresses, and it said the phrase well-known addresses a lot in the document, and apparently they thought that was repetitive because they changed some of them to other things they thought were equivalent. And I had to say, um, no. <laughs> okay? So this is why you check, because it, it might not be as obvious to them that what you just used is a well-known technical term in, in this one area of the IETF, and, it, you know, nobody else actually knows that that's a technical term. Um, Although it also might be a point when you should look at should you have included a reference to that term or something for other people. <laughs> the technical term. Um, those things can all be resolved between you and the RFC editor. Sometimes there'll be much bigger or different changes, or you will. Ha One of the worst things that comes up in Office 48 is all of a sudden you reread the document and you realize that there's something wrong with it as an editor. And what you do then is a little bit tricky, right? You, you don't kind of want to sneak uh, substantive changes in under the wire, and the RFC editor won't let you. So at that point, you might have to go through a change process to get those changes in. Um, but usually what happens is there have been some nice editorial changes to your document, and you will go, yay, and uh, agree to publication of your document. And at that point, it will get published as an RFC. Those changes uh, go on the data tracker. Changes. So the RFC editor, RFC editor changes. Do you see those on the data tracker no. from the last draft? You don't. No. Uh, no. Uh, two observations here in, in the hope of being helpful when you get into the situation. 
The first one is in 30 years of working with the I, with, with what became the IATF and, and what was the RFC editor. I have encountered unreasonable reviewers, unreasonable ADs, unreasonable things in the process. I have never found the RFC editor to be unreasonable. No, when I wrote back about the well-known addresses, yeah. for instance, I mean, their, their answer was the equivalent of, oops, we've changed it all back. Here you go. Not, not always agreeable, and there can be discussions, but as I say, I've never found the RFC editor to be unreasonable. And if you think the RFC editor is being unreasonable, talk with somebody else. It may be you. Um, the, sec the, the second observation is that occasionally during off 48, as Margaret commented, somebody discovers there is something seriously wrong with the document. Occasionally, but very rarely, it's the RFC editor. Often it is you. Sometimes it's an AD. Sometimes it's that something else changed. Sometimes it's something else changed. One of your responsibilities is working group chair, and you better assume that if you don't do it, nobody else will is making the decision as to whether the adjustments that are needed are important enough they have to go all the way back to the working group. And be conservative. Yeah. Okay, I mean, if you think they maybe should go all the way back to the working group, send them to the working group and say, I think these look okay, but I'd like to know if anyone in the working group objects. Okay, it's a very if, quick if, thing if, to if, do, and it can save you from a world of hurt. If you think there is a chance that, that participants in the working group will see the final document as published and be astonished by it, mm -hmm. then the changes need to go back to the working group. Absolutely. And we've had that happen, um, where changes were made that... <laughs> we've had that happen, where changes were made at that point that affect, for instance, on-the-wire implementations. And people knew that version 24 was approved by the ISG, so they finished their implementation, and then changes were made in Auth 48 that made their implementation obsolete, okay? And they didn't know. I mean, this is not, it's, <laughs> it could happen anyway, right? But, but they didn't know because it wasn't brought back to the working group or anything. So you need to be very conservative about bringing anything that might be a substantive change back to the working group at that point. Yes? Yeah, right, right back on one of your very early slides when you were talking about working group documents and how they change, you said something like anything that is a technical change or a substantive nature, take to the working group list. To me, that rule actually applies all the way through this process. Right. It, it was new that it applied all the way through this process, though, when we did proto. When we did proto, it was not thought that it applied all the way through this process. Yeah. It was only the um, editors that you had to get to agree, and the working group yeah. chairs kind of were aware of it. Yeah. But at this point, I think we've kind of redefined it to the point where we do expect right. it to happen yeah. all the way through. I mean, I'd certainly if you don't think it's a rule, I'd certainly recommend you still do take it back to the working group. The technical change. Right. So um, I'm going to go through a few complex situations. I don't have a lot of time left, so we'll... We'll try to focus on the ones that are the most often issues. Uh, this includes multiple competing proposals, solve the same problem, changes of consensus in the working group, intellectual property rights, interaction with other standards bodies, and sometimes complicated IANA considerations. Okay. Um, let's start with multiple competing proposals. Sometimes groups have multiple proposals to solve the same problem. Um, I heard a suggestion today that this can be a good thing that should be encouraged. I have typically viewed it as a very bad thing that, that causes things to, to, to block up, right? So there's this competing views on that. And maybe it depends on how and why you have multiple competing proposals, okay? It may be that there are situations where it's beneficial and situations where it's detrimental. Um, there are two kind of cases. Uh, where you have, let's say, you have two proposals, just for simplicity. Um, one would be where they are entirely different technical approaches and they have significant differences, um, pluses and minuses and trade-offs that have to be considered by the working group to determine which one of these approaches will work. The other is where they're similar approaches with different details, okay? Um, and both of those happen. Um, in the first case, you're going to need to have a good technical discussion on this, on these drafts, all right? And try to figure out which major proposal, major technical direction is the right direction for the working group. You as a working group chair need to somehow figure out how to guide that discussion work, or work with the document editor, the two document editors to guide the discussion or something. It probably is never going to resolve if you just keep letting these two people get up and make separate presentations of why their proposal is good. Okay? 
you need to actually ferret out the differences, point them out to the working group, say to the working group, okay, here are the nine major differences. Let's see if we can get any consensus on which way we'd like to go on any of these issues, okay? Um, you may end up with a hybrid proposal at the end or something like that, okay? That situation, while it can take time and stuff, is almost less frustrating to deal with than the other position. Because the other situation, if you have two very similar proposals and the groups are refusing to merge them, almost always is due to some weird behind-the-scenes issues. Yes? I decided there's a, um, a fairly spectacular example of both of these things at the same time in the history of the Manet working group, where they had two entirely different technical uh, approaches. There were two or three different ways of going at each of them, and at one point they had a great unification and ended up with two documents, each of which was roughly two and two-thirds of the other proposals ground together. <laughs> yep. Um, behind the scenes issues are very real, but they can be hard to discover and understand. They can be hard to discuss in working groups. They include things like matters of taste, uh, technical perspective. Um, sometimes corporate and personal interests are involved, though. Uh, companies may have intellectual property in their solution, or they may think that having it be their solution is somehow going to reflect well on their company or on themselves as a person. Okay, and it can be really hard to even find out what those issues are. Never mind figure out how to resolve them. Okay, um, there are various ways to try to lead a group to consensus. Okay, um, I've been in the situation numerous times. One of them was in CapLab. Okay, in CapLab, the way we reached conclusion, and it wasn't the most beautiful thing that has ever happened, all right, was that one of the proposals had been adopted by the working group as the working group document. Another proposal was brought in separately. And I, as a working group chair, talked to the working group, and I said that it was my perspective that the one that the working group had already had consensus to adopt is the proposal unless we reach consensus to change it. And I asked the working group if they agreed with me, and the working group very largely agreed with me on that. And then it ended up going to the one that had already been adopted because we couldn't reach consensus to change it. That's like finding a presumed winner, okay? But it was not, it would have been nicer if we had had actual agreement that one of them was better than the other, but we couldn't reach that, right? But we were able to reach an agreement that one of them had was our solution and that we would need consensus to change it. Okay, sometimes there isn't a presumed winner though. You've got two documents, they were sent in around the same time, neither of them has gotten any working group consensus, uh, and you need to um, find another way to go forward. Uh, and one of the things you can do that is find out what the differences are and reach technical agreement in the working group on um, which, which way we want to go on certain technical questions. Um, we're trying to do that in PCP over our authentication uh, documents right now, our authentication pr approaches. Um, another thing you can do is that very often you'll have a case where these four guys over there and those five guys over there are both really like their own proposals, but there are 57 people in the room. All right, and these 57 people are split because some of them think this one's a little better, some of them think that one's a little better, but most of them don't really care, okay? They'll, they might express an opinion or not, and you're starting to see the number of people who express an opinion just wane because everyone's tired of hearing the same argument. And at that point, you might try to get the group to agree that going forward, making a decision is more important than which choice is made. Okay, and at that point you can bring into play the possibility of those alternate consensus approaches that we talked about on an earlier slide, or I'm saying things to the working group like the way I'm going to do this, this poll to determine consensus is I'm going to say how many people could live with approach A, how many people could live with approach B, and if, you know, you get to the point where there are quite a few more people who could live with A than B, and it, and the people who could live with A represent a consensus of the people in the room, you say, okay, there's my consensus. And, you know, it's an issue sometimes of whether your group buys that, okay? 
as a way of reaching consensus. You don't have to say A or B. You can say A or not A, B or not B. And how do you confirm that on the mailing list? Because you said earlier that you cannot take, you know, you cannot reach consensus only in the face-to-face -face meeting, right? You write that you, you say the working group reached consensus that approach A was, you know, adequate, guys were that approach A was adequate, and we were going forward with that approach, and you see if there are people on the mailing list who disagree. So basically the result of the of the voting, let's say, in this case, is Well, it wouldn't be 55-45. It would be 83-47. Let's say 55-45. No, but it isn't. 55-45 comes up when you say, how many want A, how many want B? No, exactly. When you say you get to vote twice if you want, how many people could live with A? How many people could live with B? You sometimes get not 55, 45. True. You sometimes get 87 percent yeah. and 42 percent. That, 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 <laughs> that, that's obvious, and that solves the problem. The, the question I'm asking is more difficult, right? Yes. So if you have 55, 45 in this case, what happens then? Well, we're in that case in um, in in MIF, not on two proposals, that's but on the I question think. of whether to go forward with a proposal. And what we're trying to do is turn it into a technical discussion to see if we can resolve the issues that are causing it to be split. I mean, but the other thing you can do is the alternative consensus um, selecting uh, uh, mechanisms, that the, draft, the RFC that we talked about earlier. So let me summarize your answer in order to see if I understood it right. So 83-44 is consensus. Well, I mean, 83, 44 yeah, isn't, I mean, numbers, right. but then you call the consensus, right. right. But 55, 45 is probably not consensus, and therefore you have to reach the technical uh, agreement, let's say, or, or reach agreement on a, on a technical level and then go back for consensus. I mean, what I would do after I got the, you know, 87, 42 or whatever it is, is I would say that looks to me like we have consensus to go with choice A. You know, how many people will agree with me that we have consensus to go with choice A? How many people don't? And you're going to get that whole 57 people in the room who aren't the nine guys who have entrenched positions voting that, yes, we have consensus. Yay, go forward. And then you have consensus. Go forward with A. Right. That's your consensus question. Go forward with A or don't go forward with A, okay? I, I think, I think that, that, that's a good solution if you manage to get that. If you end up having a split decision, then you may actually, you know, have more trouble, basically, right? And this is where John wanted to talk about his crazies, too, which we can do right after we get this comment from the front. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, thanks. first, the side comment is match the discussion you've got to have to the means available to you. So, I mean, you don't do everything on the mailing list. You work out what you need to do and then confirm it on the mailing list, maybe later. Right. So, if a face-to-face -face meeting is the way to do it, do it in the face-to-face -face meeting. If you need to call a virtual intern, do it that way. If you need just a conference call and interested parties, do it that way. Ultimately, you just confirm things on the mailing list once you've done that. We don't need to take everything just to the mailing list and try and deal with it on the mailing list. Right. But the main comment I wanted to make was um, also maintain a sense of proportion. If you've got two entirely different technical approaches to the same, the same problem, does it matter if you actually need to, do you actually need to create a standard or an RFC to actually document that problem or not? Sometimes it doesn't matter. You know, it will exist in the marketplace without an RFC to back it up. ITF hasn't necessarily failed by failing to write an RFC about it. Yeah. I think, John, your question on this one was, are there cases where it might make sense to document both our proposals? Right? Uh, I was, I was going to make a comment about this and then, and then go there. Okay, go ahead. The comment about this is the really hard case, or one of the really hard cases, is where you ask the question, who can live with A? and who can live with B. And you get 87% of the people who can live with A and 83% of the people who can live with B. Right, that's a good case for one of the alternatives. That's approaches. a good case for one of the alternatives. Sometimes that has been resolved by a working group chair or area director saying, if you guys cannot make a decision, I will. And sometimes that's the right answer if it's really the case the group doesn't care. Which of the solutions, wants one of the solutions that doesn't care which one. Right. The other observation is that while many people will tell you otherwise, there is no IETF rule against a working group ejecting two competing proposals and requesting them both be standardized. That's true. You will, be in, you will be in for a very, very bad time if you cannot explain clearly in one or the other or both of those documents or in a third place exactly what the difference is and how somebody should be should think about making a choice. Right. But there's no rule against two competing proposals. 
they better be different. Two competing almost identical proposals are bad news in part because you can't write that explanation. We are three minutes over the official end time, I think, of this session. Um, the next one starts in seven minutes, so we need to, like, wrap this up quickly. Um, let me just go through a couple other things that are on the, the complex issue slides. Uh, change of consensus means that your working group changed its mind about whether or not it wanted to do this work, say, while the work is ongoing. That's very tricky to deal with. Uh, again, you're going to use your judgment. You need to work with the working group to figure out what has happened. Um, intellectual property rights. Um, the IETF has a detailed IPR policy. It's documented in the RFCs at the end of the slide and some others. Um, it requires IPR disclosure by authors and editors and encourages IPR disclosure by third parties. Um, it does not set required licensing terms for IETF technology. Uh, it does not restrict publication of documents that contain IPR. But you as a working group chair have responsibilities here. Okay, you should make sure your working group is aware of any IPR disclosures on documents that the working group is talking about. And the working group is allowed to take into account the IPR when deciding whether or not to publish a document or how to choose between multiple proposals. Um, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say the working group would prefer a document that um, could be used in open source implementations, for instance, which has certain restrictions on what um, IPR licensing terms um, it can have, okay? Um, and so that's something you may have to work through in your working group. Um, it's good to particularly read RSC uh, 3669, guide, Guidelines for Working Groups on IPR Issues, because that can be helpful if this comes up in your working group. A uh, quick thing on interaction with other SDOs. We have an official liaison process in the IETF for talking to other SDOs. Uh, there's this mailing list new work where all new uh, BOF proposals and uh, charter updates are, are sent. And so sometimes you get some feedback from other SDOs during attempting to charter a working group. Um, sometimes individual work items may involve the work of other SDOs, like IP over some IEEE document involves the IEEE. Um, in many of these cases, you may need to seek out some sort of review or feedback or something from another SDO. And the ways you do that are you talk uh, to an IETF liaison that already exists for that a SDO, or maybe you talk to your AD about whether we're going to set up a liaison relationship with that SDO. Um, there might be other ways to do it if, if you find that we don't have one and don't want one. Um, sometimes a working group will receive. The IETF receives, but sometimes it will get referred to your working group, an official liaison statement from another SDO, uh, and it will require a response. And if that happens, you should read RSC 4053. John? Uh, be aware that the current IESG proto templates, proto shepherding templates, or at least some versions of them, require that the shepherd verify that all of the authors and other people have checked out the IPR stuff. And, 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 and know that anything which has to be disclosed has been disclosed. There are some, also some issues about this liaison stuff. Do not wait until you initiate an IETF last call to be surprised by those requirements because you'll waste about a month of your life and it'll be a bad month. <laughs> yeah. um, quick note on IANA considerations. Most of them are simple and they're just handled by the document authors. Most of them are. There are none. Some of them are. I need a port. Okay. Those you don't need to overstress. Um, but complex ones may require considerable chair or, or um, pro shepherd involvement to get them right. Uh, things like if you say there should be expert review, you need to list expert review criteria. You're going to have to recommend an expert uh, to the ISG for them to appoint. You, um, if there are other complex IANA requirements like setting up a registry or something, IANA comes to these meetings and sits at the desk like all day, a couple of days and would love to sit down with you and have you actually get this right in your document instead of holding it up at the end. So talk to them. Conclusion. Yay, there's helpful web pages. Yay, lots of people worked on these slides. Uh, if you have questions, and we took a lot of them during, um, I'll stand out in the hallway for a few minutes if people have any questions they want to ask me because we need to clear out for the next session. Uh, and if you have feedback on these slides or this class, send it to EduTeam. The address is right here. Thank you very much.